Hi, and welcome to Roswell United Methodist Church. My name is Michael Cromwell, and I have the joy of serving as one of the associate pastors here at RUMC. Thanks for joining us for our on-demand version of the sermon, which will be delivered later today. If you'd like to watch our services live, you can do so via our live stream at 9 o'clock and 11.15. Notice our different worship times and our different hours that we have now. You'll also be able to see the entire worship service on demand later this afternoon at rumc.com slash sermons. We are so glad that you are with us today. We're thankful for your presence and we're thankful for your generosity and the different ways that you are helping to make RUMC a place of community and faith. Let's have a word of prayer before we hear our sermon. Gracious and loving God, we love you so much and we are grateful for this day and this day that we have to worship you. May the words that we are to hear, may they not only pierce our ears, but pierce our hearts as well, that we might be changed in different people because of what you have to say to us today. We thank you and we love you all in Christ's name we pray, amen. Now let's hear our sermon from today. Greetings, my name's Jeff Ross. I'm one of the associate pastors here at the Roswell United Methodist Church. Thank you for joining us during this time of worship. I'll be reading from 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 through 9. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you, who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. In all this you greatly rejoice, Though now, for a little while, you may have to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. These have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith, of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may result in praise, in glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with inexpressible and glorious joy. For you are receiving the end result of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Let us pray. God, we give you thanks for this day, for the opportunity to join together in worship. And I pray that uh, your spirit would use these words to uh, minister to us, to teach us, to guide us, to lead us, to heal us. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Well, this is the Sunday after Easter, and uh, maybe you're still sort of basking in the joy and excitement uh, of that day, and maybe still a little full from some of the chocolate that you've been eating uh, all week. And so I thought we would follow one of the characters that were uh, important in the Easter story and see where they are and what's going on with them a few years later. And so we've, we've read the passage from 1 Peter, and Peter was one of the uh, main characters in the Easter story, but really in the whole New Testament. And so I want to back up a little bit with Peter and sort of uh, figure out what's happened to him to get to the place where he would write these words. And so Peter was a fisherman. He was living the life and enjoying that, uh, I guess, as much as he could. Uh, And then Jesus finds him. Jesus finds him, calls him, uh, and Peter has a dramatic, crazy turn in his life uh, from a fisherman to following Jesus. Uh, It appears from all accounts that he feels blessed, amazed, fortunate uh, that Jesus found him, that their paths intersected. And uh, uh, Peter goes on to be one of the main disciples, one of the folks that Jesus trusted the most. He was a remarkable person. Uh, I wonder if in this life, in his lifetime, if he knew that, understood that, uh, if he had any inkling what his legacy would be like. 
Well, he becomes really close to Jesus, and then in the last hours, he denies Jesus when Jesus needed him the most. His humanity overtakes him, and he cowers to the carnal temptations that plague all of us. He has to feel like he's squandered the greatest opportunity uh, uh, in his life. But he doesn't have to despair for very long because it's just a few days later when Jesus encounters him again on the shore where he's been fishing uh, and restores him to faith and to joy and as a a leader in the Christian movement and, and church. So here in 1 Peter chapter 1, again years later after those events have taken place, we find that Peter is still ecstatic over the opportunities that he's been given, the forgiveness that he's received, and the uh, culmination of all the conversations that he's had with Jesus. And he's trying to help us understand uh, this wonderful idea, concept that he lists here about our inheritance. Um, Now, when we say the word inheritance, I'm I'm guessing that many of you uh, have gone to economics. When you hear the word inheritance, you think about either the inheritance that you're hoping to leave or an inheritance that you're hoping to get or somebody else. But we we tend to shift our focus economically. uh, And that's not what Peter is talking about, but that's what I want us to talk about today, sort of the difference between the two. So, Peter says in this first chapter, Praise be to God, God's great mercy has giving, given us a living hope. And he has given us an inheritance that cannot perish, spoil, or fade. And it's kept in heaven for you. Now, when you think of an inheritance or you think of your retirement, uh, I bet if somebody told you that it couldn't perish, spoil, or fade, you would jump over whatever it is that they were selling. So that's what I want us to look at today, this idea of of inheritance or our retirement and what we save for and what Peter is, is talking about here in this passage. Because you and I seem to be more focused on the here and now, on this life, and uh, taking care of ourselves and our family. And a lot of us have a lot of responsibility, a lot of people counting on us. And so uh, that, that can be nerve wracking after a while. And so when we begin to think of our inheritance here, it, it seems like it, it consumes all of our time to where we don't have really much time or capacity to think of, of much else. So life uh, boils down in a lot of cases to trying to fill up our basket uh, with the eggs, uh, our nest eggs, and all the things that are going to make life here uh, possible uh, and helpful. And so maybe in your life, as you thought of your nest egg and the inheritance that you might leave, maybe you started off slowly. Uh, You weren't able to save much. You didn't have much extra. And so it's just an egg or two at a time that you were able to save or invest or do something with. And then maybe as you grew and uh, maybe got some help, uh, that began to grow a little bit and you were able to do more. Uh, Maybe with the help of compound interest, which is a wonderful thing, uh, you were able to not only contribute uh, uh, finances to your own retirement and your own nest egg, your own basket, uh, but the compound interest was able to make that grow as well. And so over time, maybe other things happened. Maybe you uh, won a, a gift and you were able to put a a number of things in at a time. Maybe you uh, collected an inheritance of your own. A family member or somebody you know left you some, and you were able to start to build that to where it was really something that you uh, felt like um, maybe it could last. Um, Maybe you sold a house or a business or something and were also able to put in some more, uh, a whole bunch at a time. But maybe... You didn't have any of those advantages. You were just able to do a little bit uh, at a time. Maybe you relied on a pension fund or some 401k program through the place that you worked or through something you set up on your, by yourself. Maybe you uh, 
have contributed to Social Security and are hoping that that will uh, be something that you can count on. Uh, but over time, hopefully, you, were, you have been and are able to grow this nest egg uh, into something that uh, will be enough. And, and, and that's the challenge, though, isn't it? Because all of us read the papers and the economic news and all of those things, um, and that number of what it would take to live comfortably is always a moving target. And, uh, and so our concern now, once we have this nest egg or, or something approaching it, is we're paranoid about guarding it, keeping it, maintaining it, growing it. You know, what if I lose it? What if something happens? What if I outlive the money and the funds that I have set aside? So we employ bankers and accountants and actuaries and a whole plethora of people uh, to help us keep track of this nest egg to make sure that it'll do all of the good that we want it to do. Um, but again, we worry, don't we? With each newscast, uh, with each economic downturn, with each dip in the stock market, uh, with each civil unrest, with each world uh, skirmish, uh, we wonder if the possibility that this can get wiped out. And so uh, our focus, again, uh, seems to be, uh, if you, you watch the news and everything else, that we're focused on this, this nest egg, this inheritance, this uh, retirement, this direction in our life. And it, it's so consuming at times that there's very little time for, for anything else. But that's not what Peter is talking about uh, so much in this passage. But to be fair, Peter's day was a little different. P Peter's culture was a little different. In biblical times, fewer number of people made it to a retirement age. Uh, and, and retirement, as we know, it hadn't been invented yet. In fact, it was customary in Peter's day for people just to work uh, till they died, till they dropped. The idea of retirement was scattered over history in a variety of places. Caesar Augustus, about the time of Jesus and Peter, actually uh, began to offer and, and pay for a, a limited time uh, soldiers who had come back from war a uh, retirement package. In the 1500s, Parliament uh, uh, voted on a retirement package for soldiers who had served in uh, conflicts. In 1875, the first private sector pension plan in the United States was offered by American Express. And so uh, think about it, 1870, late 1800s was the, really when pensions began to be established. So up until then, this idea uh, uh, wasn't so much uh, the, the process of folks. Everybody had to fund that themselves, separately, privately. In 1883, there was a chaotic time in Germany and the chancellor, uh, Bismarck, uh, to try to get reelected, uh, offered the citizens uh, a pension if they were over 65. And many historians say this was brilliant because it's, it's long before penicillin was invented, which meant that a lot of folks didn't live past 65. So the pension system that Bismarck set up wasn't going to break any bank. But again, as we go back to our scripture passage, this is a little different than what Peter is talking about. But Peter is talking about an important idea because we get so focused on this, this basket, but Peter is talking about this basket. And when we focus all of our attention on that basket, this one is empty. And that's where Peter is asking us to spend some time as we move past Easter. Peter is celebrating this wonderful inheritance that we have that's made possible by the life and death and resurrection uh, of Jesus Christ. But he's pointing to this time and this place and this reality 
Uh, but he's not overlooking the work that still needs to take place here. And if all of our attention and energy is focused on ourselves and on economics, uh, then uh, then we miss the opportunity and also the joy. And I hope that you picked up on that as we read the scripture passage, the joy that, that Peter has as he talks about this. Peter's not looking uh, at now. He's looking at a different time frame. He's not worried about this life. He's worried and interested and focused on this second life. And he's investing most of his resources in this basket and not in this one. Now, I know Peter had to be practical. He had to pay for his house. He had to pay for food. He had to pay for the things that, that he used and he did. He had to take care of his mom and all of those things. But um, not so much that he neglected the things that he's trying to tell us is of utmost importance. Peter is rejoicing that his ticket is stamped, that it can't perish or fade or spoil, and it's kept in heaven. As the theologian M.C. Hammer said, you can't touch this. Peter has been touched by God's grace. He is amazed that he has received second, third, fourth, fifth chances for redemption. He knows that he has gone through and endured uh, great struggles up until this point, and he imagines that he'll undergo great struggles uh, in his life uh, before it's over. He knows the climate and the political climate of the day that he, he, he lives in, but he's not so consumed by the troubles, worries, struggles of this life uh, that he neglects to rejoice in the life to come. Romans 8, Paul, like Peter, says nothing can separate us from the love of God. So, so don't worry so much about it. Neither life, nor death, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things before us, or under us, or over us can separate us from the love of God. Peter's reward and his focus and his mindset is different. Jesus talked about these treasures as well. And he says, don't uh, store up for yourselves treasures on this earth. Now, that doesn't mean we're not to be practical or prudent or, or take care of our responsibilities and families. But he said, seek first the kingdom of God and all of the things that we need will take care of themselves. He just says to keep it in balance, to get our priorities straight, to focus at least some of our time and energy on this second basket. In the rest of First Peter, Peter kind of steers us in that direction. And he says, therefore, set your minds on hope and grace. Let that be the thing that guides you in your life. Don't conform to this world. Be holy in all that you do. Work. For you know that it is not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed. You, your salvation hasn't been bought with the resources that you have accumulated, but was handed down to you through the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. So love one another." In the first verse of chapter 2, he goes on to say, Rid yourselves of malice and deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and slander. I like the way that R.L. Sharp says this in a poem that's entitled A Stumbling Block or a Stepping Stone. And he says, Isn't it strange how princes and kings and clowns that caper in sawdust rings and common people like you and me are builders for eternity. Each is given a list of rules, a shapeless mass, a bag of tools, and each must fashion ere life is flown a stumbling block or a stepping stone. Let us pray. 
God, we thank you for your grace and mercy. We recognize that as we move on from Easter, there's much to do. And, uh, and we can get so caught up in the concerns and trappings of this world uh, that we lose sight of uh, uh, where you're guiding and, and taking us. We can lose sight of what's really important in our lives. We can invest so much energy and time in, in the things of this world that we neglect the things of the world to come. So God, help us to keep that in ba balance. Help us to be light uh, in a world around us that's so consumed by this world that they can see little else. God, thank you for your grace and your mercy and your spirit at work in each of us. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thanks again for joining us today. Um, just a reminder, if you'd like to watch the entire worship service, you can do so via live stream at 9 o'clock and 11.15 a.m. You can also view the service on demand a little bit later this afternoon at rumc.com slash sermons. Also, if you have any prayer requests, we would love to hear about those. You can send those in to pray at rumc.com. Also, if you'd like to give of your tithes and your offerings, you can do that online as well. And that's at rumc.com slash giving. Uh, thanks again for joining us today and for honoring God with your presence. We hope and pray that you have a wonderful week and we look forward to seeing you again next week. Hi. Thank you for joining us. My name's Tom Davis. I'm senior pastor here at Roswell United Methodist Church. Our mission here at RUMC is to help people live a Christ-centered life. We're a welcoming church, we're a biblical church, and we're a compassionate church. That the, we believe that the way that, that God made us, that he made us in his image. And what the Bible tells us is that his image is an us, is an our. When God said in the creation story, let us create humans in our image, he made us to be in community together. He made us to connect to him and one another. That's the place that this is at Roswell United Methodist Church, a place of community and faith. I want to invite you to join us. It might be online, it might be through social media, or it might be here in person. We meet at 9 o'clock in a contemporary service with a band. We also have two 1115 services. One is here in the sanctuary with a traditional choir and organ. We also meet at 1115 with a band in our chapel. Thank you for joining us, and I look forward to meeting you.